Okay, welcome back everyone. We have started talking about uh, Saul's encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. So before we go ahead, I just thought uh, we can quickly see you know, about the last part uh, you know, that, that we discussed about Philip and his journey. So I'll just quickly show that particular So this is how it looks. We have earlier seen that he was in Jerusalem and then he comes up to Samaria. From Samaria, he is told to go uh, to Gaza. And so he comes here and this is where he meets the Ethiopian eunuch who was traveling to, uh, who was traveling out back from Jerusalem. And the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, from Jerusalem, uh, he must be going headed back home. Uh, but here, Philip meets the Ethiopian eunuch, and obviously, the Ethiopian eunuch, eunuch went back to Africa, and uh, uh, Philip continues his journey. So from here, he was transported supernaturally to Azotis, which we all wish, right? It, I don't know, maybe uh, in our ministry, but. It still happens, so you never know uh, whether it, one of us may experience that. And he was supernaturally transported to Azotus, and from there, you know, he goes around preaching the churches of Caesarea, and uh, that is how the map, map looks, just for our clarity. All right, now let's come back uh, to the experience of Apostle Paul. Uh, so we we talked about. Uh, Jesus responding to the persecution of uh, Saul and he says, why are you persecuting me? But uh, look at the response which Saul had. Obviously, he knew that this was something supernatural. And so with awe and reverence, he responds and says, who are you, Lord? Okay, that is the question which uh, Saul has. And he uses the term Lord because for a, a person like him to know in that moment that this is supernatural, this is beyond the, the normal, uh, normal uh, occurrence in the natural world uh, is something amazing because he recognized that this is God. Remember, even Saul is a devout Jew. So he had the fear of God in his heart. So he responds to the voice say who are you lord and then jesus uh you know who does not need any introduction is introducing himself uh, think about the kindness of our god you know god could have said how dare you ask me who i am you know because i'm i'm the one who has created the entire universe but that was not his response instead when paul wanted to know uh, who the voice is uh, uh, whose voice it was Jesus responds and says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Okay, It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So the goats are like some sticks in which, uh, you know, if you have cattle and they would use certain sticks to guide their direction. And those sticks would uh, restrict the, the feet of the cattle. And it was hard for them to kind of, you know, come out of that or to resist uh, the, uh, you know, the sort of uh, the way it would work, those sticks, right, to, to um, indicate to the cattle which direction they need to go in and all that. So um, in a sense, you know, Jesus was telling him that you can't do your own thing. Okay, you can't resist what I am doing uh, in God's... In, people's lives as well as in your life because uh, I'm God at the end of the day. So that kind of language would have uh, made sense to Saul. I know that for us today, we ask like, what is the meaning of this? Uh, what is the insertion of goats and kicking against the goats? But it's uh, a restriction or, uh, you know, some sort of, I'm not getting the right word to really tell you but some sharp 
extremely sharp stick which was used to get an ox going the way you want it when flowing because okay, so that's what it is uh, and uh, Saul would have understood that language so uh, let's see what else uh, happens here the response of uh, Saul is in reverence trembling and astonished he asked Lord what do you want me to do wow it sounds like Acts chapter 2, isn't it? The people, when they heard the sermon of Peter, that's how they responded. And at this point, earlier we saw uh, in the previous chapter, there was a person of great influence, the Ethiopian eunuch, who got touched. And now in Acts chapter 9, it's a persecutor. The most unlikely person that we would consider for uh, you know, forgiveness and salvation. But God is God. He's touching the lives of all kinds of people. And uh, Paul, obviously, he's touched. Paul is convinced in that encounter that Jesus is the Christ. And so now, uh, you know, he is asking God uh, and Jesus, Lord, what do you want me to do? Him saying Lord itself is amazing. Because here is a persecutor. He's even killing those who follow this Jesus. And in a short moment, he is using the term Lord to uh, speak to Jesus. So uh, Saul is touched. Saul is convinced. Saul is uh, uh, changed in that encounter on the road to Damascus. He had a different agenda, but God changed the agenda of his entire life on that particular road. Okay? Uh, and so we see that Saul is now willing to hear what God wants him to do. And God instructs him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So again, you see the direction of the Holy Spirit, the direction of God in the entire book of uh, Acts is something that we must desire for. Like, wow, these people are hearing from God. God is talking to different ones. And uh, right now it is Saul to whom God gives an instruction and says, go into Damascus, just go into the city. You know, I'll tell you what to do next. But for now, this is what I want you to do. Next step. So in our lives, as I told us earlier, sometimes we want to know the entire picture. But how does God work? Maybe the next step is all that God thinks necessary to reveal to us. And even for Saul, it was just the next step. And so now what happens? Uh, we know that this was a real encounter because there were people who were with Saul who saw, uh, you know, they... Uh, sorry, they didn't see anyone, but they heard the voice. So the voice which was speaking to Saul, they heard it. So if it was just Saul um, having some sort of a delusional exp experience, imaginary, uh, uh, you know, encounter, then we can blame, you know, uh, Luke for it. But Luke, I already told us that he was... Uh, very detailed uh, person uh, in his accounting. He was also like, you know, a doctor by profession. So he didn't miss out on the important facts that he needs to tell the readers. He's pointing out that whatever happened to Saul on the road to Damascus was not in his imagination. It was real because there were people who were standing next to him who heard the voice, but they did not see anyone. Okay, So there were others who testified to what actually happened. And they stood speechless, also tells us that this was supernatural, which the others uh, could also testify to. And then you know, we uh, see that when God spoke to Saul and met him in this way, uh, Saul, he arose from the ground, but one thing happened to him that he was not able to see any longer. Okay. Now we can all ask the question, why is it that Saul became 
blind and uh, there are uh, so many explanations that people give they say that oh uh, there was a bright light when he had the encounter and maybe that affected his eye uh, now we don't know though all these things are speculations but one thing we know is that when he had that particular encounter uh, when he arose he uh, couldn't see and so he had to be led by hand into the city of damascus and uh, over there he was fasting for three days without sight and neither ache nor uh, drank. Now, again, the question arises, why was Paul fasting? Uh, we can only have some speculation. One thing is that uh, uh, about Saul, we, we will see later on also, that the Jewish tradition, the Jewish customs are something that uh, uh, he had practiced his entire life. So maybe at, at a time like this, when he needed to show reverence to God, the right thing to do was to fast and to seek the Lord uh, while he waited for his eyes to be healed. Or he could have just fasted and, and prayed, repenting of his uh, uh, sins, of how he was persecuting the Jews. Or you know he could have been asking God for a touch or a healing for his eye or direction for his life. There's so much that could have actually gone on in Paul's heart. And uh, uh, he would have chosen to fast and pray, seek the Lord in those moments. Or it can just be that the encounter was overwhelming for him because it was supernatural. He never expected it. You know, how if God uh, inter, uh, sort of intercepts uh, in our lives and uh, we, were, we were thinking of some grand plans, but here is God just coming in, you know, intercepting our lives and showing us a different direction. Uh, it can be such a jolt. And so maybe he was just shocked that something like this has happened uh, and he had a supernatural encounter. And so you find that uh, he goes into the seeking God mode. He's fasting for three days. He didn't eat anything. He didn't drink anything. Uh, that sounds like the fast of Esther. You remember? She also fasted three days. No eating, no drinking also. So they didn't even drink water. So this is like an Esther fast, a dry fast that he went into. Uh, now let's see. God had told him that, hey, I will tell you once you go into the city of Damascus. Now how does God actually minister to him? Let's uh, start to read from verse 10. Let's read till verse 19. Yeah. yeah. Now, now uh, was, yes. Go ahead, Rosalind. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul, uh, Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Should I continue? Yes, thank you, Rosalind. So uh, we're looking at how God guided him in Damascus. So now we are introduced to a man known as Ananias. This is not the Ananias and Sapphira, uh, that Ananias. That's a different Ananias who uh, 
experienced a severe judgment in the time of great revival. This Ananias is from Damascus. He's a disciple, it says. That means he's a believer in the Lord Jesus. And uh, uh, nothing more is mentioned about him. Uh, therefore, when we are only told that he's a disciple, he's probably like an ordinary believer. Right? So you just look at the ways in which God works. God is reaching out to Ananias. And the, uh, from chapter 8, we are, we are seeing uh, the prophetic communication of God. Meaning, how does God speak to people? We saw how the angel came and told uh, Philip, uh, go down, you know, go down to Gaza. Uh, and uh, then we saw how uh, Philip receives. How he received, we don't know. Maybe in the spirit he got that communication where God said, okay, go, overtake the chariot. Right? And then we saw the supernatural transportation. Now what's happening? Encounter. Paul has an encounter on the road. Uh, he hears a voice from heaven and all. Okay, that's all done. Now coming to Ananias, another picture here is that a vision. A vision uh, is, is what he receives, Ananias. Okay, So the Lord is speaking to him in a vision. And the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. How would you like that? How would we like it? You know, we get a vision which God is saying, Nancy, or you know, or any one of us, uh, uh, success or uh, Jafina. That means there is something very specific that God wants to tell us. Okay, so uh, how does Ananias respond? You know, thank God for people like Philip and Ananias. They are responding. Uh, positively and uh, obediently. Uh, maybe that's why God went to them, isn't it? So uh, the response of Ananias, here I am, Lord. Yes, present, present, ma'am, as students say in the class. So he shows up and he says, yes, I'm available. Lord, please tell me what to do. And uh, the Lord said to him, directions, right? Everywhere, arise and go. So much work to do. We can't afford to sit down and uh, you know, rest or uh, sleep. It's so exciting. God is getting people on their toes and saying, come on, get up. You have to go here. You have to go there. Do this, do that. So again, there's a message to Ananias. Uh, Paul, Saul was told to come to Damascus. Now, where is Ananias going? Arise, go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. This would have been a shock for Ananias. I'll tell you why. But you notice how God communicates. So there's a vision. In the vision, there is an instruction. But in the instruction, there is a word of knowledge. Because Ananias is being told the address of a persecutor. How would we like it? You know, in the vision, we are the only ones. We came to know where the persecutor is. And God is telling us, okay, go. Uh, here, you know, in India, we have like Fifth Cross, uh, Seventh Main Road, all that, and the house, maybe MG Road, and uh, go to house number 3322. Okay, if there is a house there, please don't go. But I'm just saying random, right? But word of knowledge. How would Ananias know where to go? You see, God can give us specific information as well. We just need to desire it. It has happened in the book of Acts. It's nothing, you know, great for God. He can give very, very specific information. Um, in this case, it's an address. So God gave Ananias Saul's address and very clearly who this Saul is. Not just any Saul. Saul of Tarsus. Uh, and I'm sending you to him uh, because he's seeking me. He's praying. Remember, he was fasting, isn't it? So he's seeking me. Now, uh, and see how God is communicating in this situation. He's saying, now Saul has also been informed. He saw in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. So both sides God has communicated that this is what he intends to do. Ananias, get up, go to this address, meet Saul of Tarsus because you have to lay your hands on him and Pray for him. He will receive his sight. Okay. Now let's see what is the response of this obedient disciple who said, yes, here I am, Lord. Okay, Ananias, what do you have to show us? Verse 13. 
how Ananias is trying to, uh, you know, give God a justification. He says, uh, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bite all who call on your name. So he's telling God, as if God doesn't know, this assignment is dangerous, Lord. Like, in other words, uh, reconsider or pick someone else. You know, I, I cannot jeopardize my own life. You want me to go to this man who has come here with the agenda of persecuting, killing? Oh, why would somebody go and meet such a person? So he's trying to tell God what God already knows. Okay, sometimes we do that. When God speaks to us, we try to say, are you sure? Is that my number or is it a wrong number? Like, Lord, what's happening? But God says to Ananias, I know what I'm doing. Okay, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. In other words, Jesus is saying, this person is going to be a minister of God and you know his influence is, is great uh, and he'll go through a lot you know, for the kingdom of God. Uh, so you don't worry. So he's being convinced that now Saul of Tarsus is no longer that persecutor, but he is now a disciple or a believer, you know, beginning as a believer, and of course, he will become a disciple of the Lord Jesus. So now that God has given him the assurance, Ananias is okay. So in verse 17, he went his way and entered the house. Again, that shows us how uh, sensitive Ananias, just like Philip, was to the voice of God, that he was convinced by what God showed him you know, about this Saul of Tarsus. Uh, and he goes, whatever God told him uh, in, in that instruction, he does that. He lays hands on him and he calls him Brother Saul. Okay. You know, all these things are very minor, but it shows us how people responded uh, to the voice of God because it was very clear for them. So for Ananias at this point, it was no longer fear. He first of all went and entered the house and he's calling the persecutor brother. So apparently in uh, you know those times when they used, you use the word brother or brethren, they're referring to other believers. So by now Ananias is sure that Saul is a believer. So he says, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and immediately what happens? The scales fell off his, something like scales uh, falls off his eyes. He received his sight uh, and he arose and was baptized. But we also know that he would have been filled with the Holy Spirit because that's why Ananias actually went there. So what's happening in these moments? Three days ago, uh, you know, he encountered God. He's blind and uh, he's a believer, but he doesn't know what to do. Does he know about the vision for his life? You know, we don't know at this point whether he's clear on those matters. Uh, but he's seeking the Lord. Okay. Uh, you see, even for Paul, he needed to go through that growth step by step, just because he was uh, uh, meant to be a mighty apostle, God doesn't, you know, exempt him from the important truths of the word. Like, you know, we notice here that, uh, yes, he needed healing for the blindness, but he needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and also he had to be baptized in water. So both of those things actually happen. And uh, <coughs> now Saul is a confirmed believer in the Lord Jesus. Others who hear about him, uh, at least other believers who would hear about, may have heard about him, would have a little bit of peace in their hearts knowing that, okay, finally, you know, this man has given his life to Jesus. But one more uh, truth that I want to point out for us here is that uh, 
like who did god pick to pray for baptism in the holy spirit for a mighty apostle what is the status of uh, ananias is he a prophet or is he some pastor or some teacher is a normal disciple ordinary believer exactly exactly so that's the point see for god no he uses anyone to minister to anyone and it it's such a privilege to know that uh, an ordinary disciple that's whom god picked to minister to you know apostle paul about whom we are, this half the course is about him <laughs> but god picked an ordinary believer and sometimes even in our lives right god we just tell us you go do this you go pray for someone go lay hands on someone uh, don't worry too much about you know who that is what it's all about obedience and those little steps that we take to minister and similarly uh, when it comes to you know we observe someone ministering maybe a child is uh, praying for uh, an adult and we must not stop them saying oh what can god do through this child god use ananias to minister to paul god can use anyone to minister to anyone uh, and uh, that is a reality which we see in scripture so at this point so we have seen how uh, saul is now fine his his vision is back uh, he is baptized in the holy spirit he is baptized in water he has made his he has made his you know a uh, confession that he is a follower of the lord jesus christ uh, and uh, what happens after that so we are told that he continued to stay in damascus for a little more time um, when he was strengthened so he you know after fasting he broke his fast and went back to uh, his uh, regular eating and he was strengthened both physically and i'm sure spiritually other disciples uh, would have strengthened him and taught him uh, a couple of things about following jesus and so he remained there now let's move on and let's see what happens uh, to the ministry of saul let's read from verse 20 to 22 immediately he preached to Christ in the city that he is the son of god then all who heard were amazed and said Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus proving, uh, proving that this Jesus is the Christ Yeah, thank you, Zeli. So um, obviously, we know that the call on uh, Saul's life was to minister to many people. We saw that, right? God spoke to Ananias and said, "You'll stand before kings." So he was going to influence the influencers. That's his call. Uh, and notice how, when we carry the call of God, it stirs us up to do what we are called to do. Okay. Uh, and so saul could sense it right from the start and apart from that his natural personality his natural training his natural background we know that he came from uh, a very learned uh, you know upbringing and uh, no wonder he was part of the synagogue because you had to be very highly qualified to be a part of that group so even from his natural experiences and his personality he seems to be more of a leader he seems to be more of someone who steps out uh, and and uh, goes for whatever they believe in and so immediately we are told so once now uh, Saul is settled he's stronger physically and growing uh, spiritually he starts to preach immediately he preached the christ in the synagogues and you also notice how the uh, synagogues are uh, the places where the jews gather right for uh, learning for uh, fellowship so in the synagogues 
so he goes and he begins to preach but this time who is he preaching about he's preaching about the son of god so that is a puzzling matter for um, everyone yeah, in the entire region because if you see somebody who hates jesus loving jesus overnight it's hard to accept very hard to accept and uh, people were amazed and they were questioning they were saying isn't this the same person who was destroying those who believed in this name and now he is out um, preaching in that same name what's going on but scriptures tell us that he continued to do what god called him to do so you know when we carry the call of god in our lives you see those uh, you see those you know like i know how to put it like embers maybe when we are even when we are young even when we don't have uh, great opportunities the call of god stirs us up sometimes you know and then we just begin to do what we are called to do and uh, there will be a good amount of time before paul can actually start to preach you know uh, uh, but right after his conversion we see that he's trying to step into the call that god has for his life and he continued to strengthen himself he went uh, to the synagogues and it says confounded the jews who dwelt in damascus so that means he he probably got him got reasoning with jews you know, people asking him questions uh, and he was able to answer those questions and um, uh show them why the lord jesus is the messiah so he was proving that jesus is the messiah uh and it's understandable he came from a learned background so he was a very intellectual man uh he would have been able to just the way we saw you know others quote from the scriptures uh he would have been able to quote the scriptures really well to convince the jews of uh, the fact that jesus is the messiah so now let's move on uh, what happens in verse uh, 23 maybe we can read the entire stretch uh, from verse 23 to verse 30 now after many days were passed the jews plotted to kill him but their plot became known to saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket saul at jerusalem and when saul had come to jerusalem he tried to join the disciples but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple but barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and he declared to them how he had seen the lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at damascus in the name of jesus he was with them at jerusalem coming in and going out and he spoke boldly in the name of lord jesus and disputed against the hellenists but they attempted to kill him when the brethren found out they brought him down to caesarea and sent him out to tarsus Yes, thank you, Roslyn. So uh, we are looking at how um, Paul is moving towards the call that God has for him. We saw that he was going to the synagogues, confounding the Jews, proving that Jesus is the Christ. But he may have felt the need to go to the place where it all began, to Jerusalem. Uh, we saw, right? We saw uh, uh, how ministry was coming out of Jerusalem. so he may have thought if i go to jerusalem meet the apostles uh, i may have an opportunity to be trained by them or sit under their teaching and learn but he goes there he tries to join the disciples but what is the response they are also afraid of him and uh, they are not able to believe how can a man like this who has persecuted the disciples now suddenly claim to be a disciple so they don't receive him but remember barnabas we talked about barnabas earlier we said he was a son of encouragement and he was also from a pretty wealthy background uh, so maybe barnabas understood you know where 
Saul is coming from. And uh, he was the one who uh, did this, this work of, um, I don't know how, how to say this, but not really convince the apostles, but to make a way for Saul. Because till that time, he was not accepted, even among the apostles. But there was a man like Barnabas, you know, who, who seems to be, who seems to have this personality of, hey, uh, everyone's important, and, uh, you know, we must, uh, we must uh, care even for someone whom we are not able to accept. So he seems to have that kind of a very accommodating personality. And so a persecutor such as Paul, he, uh, instead of uh, uh, shunning him away, he says, okay, come, let me do something for you. I will take you to the uh, apostles. And uh, he takes us all to the apostles and he tries to speak to them about everything that happened in Saul's life uh, so that they can understand that now this man is a true disciple. So once Barnabas did this bridging job, uh, they were accepting of him and we are told that he was with them at Jerusalem. Uh, but later on, you know, some of the epistles that uh, Apostle Paul writes, we'll notice that he was not there for a very long time. He was there for a short duration. So we can't even say that all the teachings that uh, the apostles had, they were able to impart it to him right away, not at all. He was there for a very short period of time uh, and, uh, you know, he continued to do the work that he knew to do. So he went ahead and he started preaching about Jesus. Uh, there were the Greek-speaking Jews, the Hellenists, uh, uh, who disputed with him, we are told. Uh, and things went so far that they disliked him to the extent of attempting to kill him. Okay, So now it is quite clear for us that <coughs> this man, uh, Saul, uh, is a disciple. He's preaching Jesus to the extent that people are even wanting to kill him. Uh, right? So um, it's clear that Saul is a disciple. And uh, when... Uh, the attempt to kill Saul happens, uh, by that time, the believers in Jerusalem are convinced that this man is genuine. And so they are willing to help him. Uh, and they uh, bring him down to Caesarea and they send him to Tarsus. So uh, Saul is originally from Tarsus. And that's the place where they might have advised him to go back to uh, for his own safety for a period of time. So uh, Saul tried to minister. It was not easy, uh, but he managed to minister for a short period of time and he sent back to Tarsus. So now, what are some of the other things that take place? So we look at that. Let's uh, now go to verse 31. We can read all the way till verse 42. When the title called Paul the Jew arrived in the Antonia, he was not fixed in the air for the fight. And he was walking in the fear of the Lord and in the fear of the Lord. Okay, Brother Brother Lubega, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, it's not very clear what you're going to hear. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, uh, you know, attempting to read uh, would you like to continue or we can we can have another person read? asking are you hearing me now ah yes yes so much better so much better please go on okay thank you then the churches throughout all judea galilee and samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the lord and in comfort of the holy spirit they were multiplied now it came to pass, as Paul went through all the parts of the country, that he also came down into the saints who dwelt in Lydia. They, there he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, 
Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So all who dwelt at Lydia and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she came, that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in the upper room. And since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went to them with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And, the, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments with which Dorocas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then she gave, then he gave his hand and lifted her up. And when she had called, and when he had called the, the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. And it came. It became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on, on the road. So it was at that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon Atana. Amen. Wow, so all the miracles are continuing. On one uh, hand, we saw um, Philip, a uh, believer, doing ministry, Ananias, a believer, doing ministry. So though we are focusing on, you know, uh, something that is happening in the life of one or two people, there is so much more that's actually parallelly going on in the Church of Jerusalem, churches around, uh, surrounding, uh, in the surrounding regions. So one thing is clear, as, as we read, that the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, Samaria, uh, had peace and were edified. What else do we see? Walking in the fear of the Lord, comfort of the Holy Spirit, and they were multiplied. So thriving churches existed in the region because of the ongoing ministry of uh, various believers and various uh, apostles. And now another a very notable figure is included, which would be Apostle Paul, whom we will study about. But in um, the overall uh, picture, the church is thriving, or the body of Christ is thriving, persecution or no persecution, they are continuing to grow, and uh, God is you know, reaching the hearts and lives of people. Now, we will now see the focus shift to Peter. And uh, Peter is uh, ministering in some regions. We have names uh, such as you know, Sharon, Nidda, Jopa. So these places were um, about uh, 40 kilometers or 25 miles away from Jerusalem. So then you know, you know how far these apostles have actually gone and the work is thriving. So they go to uh, uh, Lydda and there is a notable miracle, a man called as Aeneas, who was bedridden eight years. Uh, he is now restored back. Uh, and, uh, you know, Peter ministers to him and he says, Jesus Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. So see how the healing is ministered in this case. There is an instruction, isn't it? So it's not always the same. We have to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Peter, again, being led by the Holy Spirit, gives that right instruction at that time and commands healing. And he says, uh, you need to uh, arise, make your bed. And he arose immediately. Wow. Supernatural. Supernatural things are taking place uh, around that region. The, and people see, the people who live there, they see and they turn to the Lord. So what is a property of miracles or healings, deliverances? What does it do uh, to, uh, you know, uh, those who are seeing these things manifest? Their hearts get stirred up towards God. Uh, in this case, very clearly, Luke writes, they turn to the Lord. 
when they saw this uh, eight year paralyzed man uh, recover and next is a resurrection think about you know peter's ministry he has gone to lida and uh, you know he he has ministered to this paralyzed man he must have thought okay time to take a holiday now i'm so tired you know? uh, god has done powerful things let's take rest but what happens uh, right after right at jopa there is a lady a very a devout good lady uh, known for her good works but she became sick and died her name is uh, tabita and uh, what happens uh, immediately you know they uh, since lida was near jopa and the disciples had heard that peter was there they were like okay peter we know you're in the neighborhood you better come here because there's another task for you and uh, how would peter have responded when the disciples came and said you know what there's a lady she just died and they are supposed to raise her from the dead can you come uh, can you come quickly okay so this is the way peter's ministry is going and a man full of faith okay he just goes to um, uh, jopa and there he is ready to minister even to somebody who is dead and he says tabita he knelt down and prayed turning to the body he says tabita arise and another miracle happens what is this resurrection she opened her eyes okay and when she saw peter she sat up okay every region uh, something amazing is going on and so we see that the church and the work of god is thriving so the passage there says i became known throughout all jopa and many believed in the lord so in this manner the god uh, was actually causing the church to be uh, very fruitful and we noticed that some of these places uh, they were at two highways at that time egypt and syria highway uh, jopa and jerusalem highway so you know in those uh, regions as people came to know the lord uh, we are sure that you know the gospel would have spread uh, further away from here as well so uh, these are the notable works that god was doing in the midst of his people and then you know peter stayed in the house of uh, a man a tanner by the name of simon uh, there's something amazing that will take place you know even uh, at, at during this stay uh, at simon's house but we'll talk about that in the next class so let's just stop here if there's anything you want to talk share you can share if not we can just pray and close for today amen yeah so true no zeli uh, we are reading it and we are amazed i don't know how it was when it was actually happening and if you look at scripture even today we should be experiencing these amazing things okay so let's expect let's expect god to move powerfully uh, in and through our lives and our churches uh, shall we all close with a word of prayer i just request uh, any one person to please go ahead unmute and pray please Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for the class that we had. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus. We thank you that you chose to dwell in us and you chose to uh, move through us, Jesus. What are many humans that you even think about us, Lord? But God, you do. You loved us. You gave your life for us. God, I just pray that as we are learning about uh, the power of the Holy Spirit behind uh, every disciple when we accept Him, the power of the Holy Spirit during the early churches, God, and 
as we are learning about it god i just pray that we will put it into practice we will seek you more we will keep your gospel as our priority in everything that we do on this life so that we could move powerfully for you uh, we could raise a community of believers for you jesus that the words we speak will be uh, spoken at the right time that people could be touched and be uh, and their souls could be saved for your kingdom jesus we just pray that you will use us we are surrendering ourselves jesus i surrender each and every one in this class we are just surrendering ourselves we are humbling ourselves in your presence jesus take us and use us uh, for your kingdom lord we give you all the glory and honor in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you thank you jafina thank you everyone god bless you have a blessed weekend uh, and i'll see you next week so bye for now thank you